In this part, I'll finish up the first viewpoint on the vector triple product, the uh, kind of naive vector calculus viewpoint, before going on to the differential form approach. So, um, in the the previous at the end of the previous part, we had basically made sure that uh, our guess was correct. We had been led to a guess, and we'd made sure that the guess was correct, at least in principle, by checking. Here's the guess that we got for our identity. Uh, by checking. Uh, we could check a lot of possibilities, i, j, and k, and then the multilinearity takes care of the rest. But I want to emphasize um, doing things in an elegant way, um, and we can really just get away with checking one of those cases. Here's why. Um, the main thing is this is all about symmetry and all about the naturality of both sides of the formula. Because if you look at the formula we're trying to check, both sides are just created out of either dot products or scalar multiplication or cross products in a very natural way. And so if it works for one triple of vectors, it's going to it's going to work for any triple of vectors that's just a rotation of the first triple. Okay? So, we could then just check one triple. Well, for example, we did it right here. We have i, i and j, and we made sure that that worked. And I claim that that's really enough to make sure the formula must work for everything else. Okay, why is that? <clears throat> well, um, there's a lot of triples we know we don't have to check. Remember, we don't have to check anything where b and c are parallel to each other, or where b and c are both perpendicular to a. And that already gets us out of a lot. Um, and then I claim any other triple that's not going to be covered by those exclusions already is just really going to come from i, i, j. So, Let's look at look at that. Let's see. Let's look at iij. Let's suppose we have a still being i, and I want to claim that everything else comes from that. Okay. Well, um, i i j, that would be this blue one, and this uh, this i again is the red one. The, that would be b, and then c would be the green one. That's i i j. If you just rotate that 90 degrees around the i the i axis, the x axis, then you're going to get i i k. All right, so that's another one you're going to get. Do we need anything else? Well, remember, I can't have these both being the same, or else it's obviously zero. Um, and I can't have them both being j and k because then it's uh, zero because j and k are both perpendicular to i. And order doesn't matter. We know that the order works if we switch things. It's anti-symmetric. We've checked that, and so that they can be in increasing order. So the only things they have to be, um, the only things they could be, is i, j, and i, k. So that's the only ones if the first vector, if a, is equal to i. And then if I just rotate, suppose I want something that starts with a j. Well, then I just do a rotation that takes this blue vector, the first one, which is a, into j. And then I get the same argument for the possibilities there, similarly for k. So it really turns out that just checking it on one triple, and it's really up to you, but i, i, j seem natural enough to me, um, means that it's true for all the other i, j, k triples by the symmetry then the trilinearity means is true for every vector. So that's a, that's a pretty cool way to argue. It's a very much a, a sort of a modern mathematical way to argue these kinds of things. And I wanted to, to emphasize that. So a few more extensions of the thinking we've got with this uh, example. There we go. So this is uh, often proved right after this identity. In fact, in the textbook I used, it's the very next homework problem. Um, what's called the Jacobi identity for the, the cross product. Um, so if you take a cross b cross c, and then you just cyclically permute the vectors so that a uh, has been shuffled around to the last stage, but if you kind of go in a circle, a, b, c, they're still in the same order. And similarly, a, b, back to the start, and c, those are called um, cyclic cyclically permuted triple. And we would like to show that that's equal to zero. Seems like maybe just a curiosity. It turns out to be a very, very important uh, thing that works <clears throat> in very general situations that has to do, again, with symmetry and the theory of Lie algebras and Lie groups. So let's just see how you'd prove that. Again, this is where you should pause the video. Okay, we know what this is. Let's go back up to the formula that we had. This is what we've just checked. We just finished checking. Okay, and now I'm just going to cyclically permute those guys. Let's just grab this here. Okay, so now um, the a turned into a b. Actually, I just let me just copy this and then I'll change the letters. So the a turned into a b. This ooh, this, for some reason that's not bold. 
the C turned into an A, and the B turned into a C. Again, I need to bold that. And then A turned into B, B turned into C, and C turned into A. Okay? And then the last one. So this is kind of seeing that there's a secret symmetry of this right-hand side. We knew that the right-hand side um, sort of had to be this form because it has to be anti-symmetric, it has to be trilinear, lots of features that had to be true about orthogonality. But now we're discovering there's actually some, a secret property that's, that's even cooler than we expected about the right-hand side that's going to make it easy to show that these things, three, three things all add up to zero. So now B becomes C from the last one. Uh, C becomes A, or A becomes B, rather. C becomes A, B becomes C, C becomes A, and A becomes B. Okay, so now these are just all the same identity, just re rewritten with the letters switched. But then the sum on the left-hand side, let's see what happens when we do it on the right-hand side. A dot C times B, <clears throat> does that show up? Well, it does when we remember that this, the dot product is symmetric. That's C dot A times B, and they're with opposite sign. So those cancel. A dot B times C, uh, that shows up here, B dot A times C, with opposite signs. And then B dot C times A, C dot B times A with opposite signs, and indeed, zero. So that's kind of cool, that we get this extra payoff of knowing this formula for the triple cross product. It becomes very uh, easy to see that this particular combination, the sum of all these guys, is equal to zero. Now, I just want to... Um, tell you a little, a tiny bit about the Jacobi identity. In the third view, I might well talk a lot more about it. I'm still deciding how much to go into because there's an immense amount that we could go into when we really fully talk about this in the context of, um, of symmetry and rotations and things like that. So, um, one way to think about the Jacobi identity, not the deepest way, um, is to think about, well, the, net, the, the simplest thing that could be true about this vector triple product, one of the simple thing, simplest things that you could imagine to be true, is that these two quantities should be equal. That would say that the cross product is associative. But it's not, and this is a pretty well-known fact. Um, and in fact, the Jacobi identity basically gives you some, uh, an explicit measurement of how it fails to be associative. So I claim you can easily take this identity and put make the left-hand side equal to this guy. So pause the video if you want to try that. Um, what we can do is we can just leave the first and the last terms on the left-hand side and then just take A cross B and switch it with C. That automatically turns it into a minus sign. So that really is just the first and last terms just left in place but with but rewritten a little bit. And so then it's just going to be minus of this one. And then it kind of just depends on how you want to write it. Uh, so I'll take the take these underlinings away. Okay, um, so you could write it in various different ways. It doesn't matter too much for our purposes right now. So you could just uh, flip the order. You could say, if you don't like that minus sign, whoops, that's not what I wanted. That's not what I wanted either. We'll get it eventually. There we go. C times A uh, cross B. Okay, and I'm not sure why it's doing weird things with the spacing. So there's all kinds of different ways you could write it on the right-hand side. But the main thing is that one basic way to think about why the Jacobi, Jacobi identity might be interesting, and not just a curiosity, is it talks about the failure of associativity of this operation cross. Let me talk about a, a definitely a deeper way, um, and a way that's an entry into um, some of the stuff in Lie algebras, to talk about the Jacobi identity. So let's be a little bit more sophisticated about the cross product for a second. Let's think of A and B as playing different roles here, and this is going to come up in the third view um, in a couple more videos in this series. We're going to think of B as a vector that's kind of passive, that's just sitting there. And we're going to think of A as something that's going to act on that vector. And by just crossing with, with B. So we're purposely making this a little bit asymmetrical uh, in terms of the roles of A and B. So B is a vector, and then we're taking A and using that as a tool to change B into something else. What we'll see in the third view, I'll give you a little preview, is that this is an infinitesimal rotation. And you might well know this if you've seen the cross product in physics, they talk about this a lot, um, that we're really taking B and we're infinitesimally rotating it uh, with an axis given by A. So in this case, we don't really have to know that, um, but it's going to be an action of this vector A on the vector B. One other thing I want to define is an incredibly useful and general thing. If I, Whenever I have two maps, 
from any space to itself, but R3, for example, and just say S and T, just any two functions that take a vector and spit out a vector. We define what's called the commutator, uh, which is a measurement of how much they fail to commute. Now notice we were thinking uh, just a minute ago of the Jacobi identity, talking about the failure of an operation to be associative. Well, this is a little bit, di a little bit different, but related. Um, it's the failure of these maps to commute with each other. And so it's just written as brackets with a comma, ST. That's a new map, and it's just S of T of C minus T of S of C. So they're going to commute when the commutator is 0. This is usually done for just for linear maps, um, but it actually makes sense for, for any two maps from the space to itself. Now, the claim is that the Jacobi identity really is talking about how the cross product operation relates to the commutator operation. Okay. It says that the, how A cross B acts on some vector is the same as if you look at A and B acting on it, but in both orders and you subtract and you see, see how much of a difference there is, how much C A and C B fail to commute. So one way of saying it is that these C A and C B, which we'll eventually see are infinitesimal rotations, it's saying that to measure how much two rotations, two infinitesimal rotations fail to commute, you can take the cross product of the vectors that label the rotations. So let's, let's actually show that, okay? Let's actually show, well, let's start with the right-hand side, okay? Again, good place to pause the video. So for any function, to show two functions are equal on, on either side of inequality, you have to give it some sort of arbitrary argument. And then I just expand out the definition. So this is CA uh, <coughs> of CB, uh, I was trying to bold that, of C, and then minus, and now I'm just going to copy and paste it, minus CB, CA of C. And now I'm just going to put in the definition of what, is it, what it means to do the CA, okay? Um, and so this is just going to be, well, C, B of C is just B cross C. Okay, and I'm just going to grab it from here. Not a coincidence that I can grab it from above. Okay, that's B cross C. Now, what is C, A of that? It's just A cross that. And I should have grabbed it from above, but that's okay. Okay. And what is C, B of C, A of C? I guess I'll just start doing from scratch here instead of trying to be clever with the copy and pasting. And that's A cross C. Okay. So that looks familiar. That looks like two-thirds of the Jacobi identity. Okay. But we've got to have the signs a little bit careful. Okay. Um, it's pretty similar to what the kind of manipulation we were doing in B, but let's just go back to the actual Jacobi identity up here. A cross B cross C. Let's see. Minus B cross A cross C. Ah. The minus and then the A, the C and the A have been switched. So this is exactly just these guys. Okay. Then Jacobi identity says that that's minus of this guy. So it's like, oh wait, I thought I wasn't get a, supposed to get a minus. Ah, but this is supposed to be what happens when you cross A cross B with C, but with the A cross B on the left. Okay. So this cross C. And that's indeed what happens if I take first take the cross of these two vectors, right, and put it in the subscript there and say that's the, going to be the vector that's going to act and then acting on C. So I've shown that no matter what the input is, whatever vector C there is, the commutator of crossing with A and crossing with B is the same thing as crossing with A cross B. I just said the word cross a lot, didn't I? So that's where I'll leave this. It's really a tease for, um, you know, wh how, what is this commutator doing? How do, might this r relate to rotations and things like that? Uh, but I'll come back to it by, by the end of the series of videos, although I'm not sure how deep I'm going to get into it.